and welcome to this new experiment for my channel where I will be covering some science related stories that have been popping up in the media and the literature. I will mainly be focusing on things pertaining to science, technology, education and health. There may be the occasional bit of politics and you can expect me to be impartial roughly 10% of the time. Anything more than that is just a bonus. So we begin with room temperature superconductors. Superconductors are devices through which a current may be passed without resistance, and this means that it would be possible to transmit electricity over long distances without any losses. The problem is that superconductors need to be cooled to below a particular critical temperature for it to work, and this limits the application of superconductors. In May of this year, the record for a superconductor with the highest critical temperature was broken with a material which has a critical temperature of 250 Kelvin or minus 23 degrees Celsius. The catch is that the sample has to be put under a pressure of 170 gigapascals, which is one and a half million times the atmospheric pressure. In a recent paper published in Physical Review Letters, a Chinese group outlined their predictions based on computer simulations for a superconductor with a critical temperature of 473 Kelvin or 200 Celsius. And this is pretty exciting as it means that there is a candidate for a superconductor which works at room temperature. Unfortunately, the material is predicted to be superconducting only at 250 gigapascals, and although this is achievable in a lab, it does limit the real-world applications, but it is definitely a step in the right direction. The UK's Conservative government has promised new investment in green policies, namely a £1 billion investment in the automotive industry to focus on reducing emissions in the automotive sector. Another promise is to create more green spaces and planting more trees and a new future homes standard to make sure that new homes are more energy efficient. But there's one very shiny promise, and that is the construction of a nuclear fusion plant by the year 2040. Now, the media is pretty predictable when it comes to their report on this announcement. The pro-Tory press is generally in favour of these measures, and the anti-Tory press is saying that it is not enough. Now, when it comes to the first three points, I would tend to agree with the anti-Tory press. It is nice that these policies are announced, but maybe we should be doing a bit more. Now, generally, the press is pretty excitable about the last point though. I mean, who wouldn't be? Nuclear fusion represents the ability to generate massive amounts of energy uh, with negligible waste. Now, there are a few newspapers which have said that there have been some issues around nuclear fusion and that the target may be a bit ambitious, but none have really addressed the reality. The reality is that this is that shit crazy. Now, the £220 million that the government is pledging is very welcome and it will definitely help advance research in this area, but it is not going to deliver this goal. The first milestone we need to hit in the development of nuclear fusion is to demonstrate that we can actually build a reactor which generates more power than is put in. And this experiment is being carried out in a project called ITER. However, the experiment will not be going live until 2030 if everything goes according to plan. And once ITER is live and demonstrates that it can output more power than is put in, then the next step will begin, which is to build a prototype nuclear fusion plant called DEMO. If everything goes right, DEMO will go live in 2050. Yes, 2050. The Conservatives are announcing that a fully functioning nuclear fusion plant will go live 10 years before the first prototype. The only way that this is going to happen is if the government is really made up of extra-dimensional lizard species with knowledge of advanced alien technologies. Because I have called the Tories batshit crazy, I will take a moment to call Labour batshit crazy as well, because they are. Uh, 
at the Labour conference, a policy was announced to scrap public schools in the UK. And for viewers outside of the UK, these are really private schools, but we call them public schools because Britain is weird. Generally, I am not in favour of private schools in principle. I don't really care if your parents have more money than sense and want to send you to a really expensive private school. My issue is that private schools generally do not prepare students for university as well as state schools, and they also foster quite a bit of crony in business. That aside, abolishing private schools is silly. The taxpayer will be footing the bill for buying out private property or having to add capacity to existing overcrowded state schools. What could possibly be a sensible alternative is to take all that money you intend to spend on abolishing private schools and just invest it in the current state schools we have. Um, we can fix the culture within schools so teaching becomes an attractive profession again. We can invest in staff and resources so teachers can actually teach again rather than drill a list of facts into the student's head for them to regurgitate during exams. With this policy, uh, it's just like the Tories and their fusion power. Labour is more focused on presenting an image to win votes rather than developing sensible policy. However, this move is unlikely to produce that effect, unlike the Tories and their batshit nuclear fusion policy, which may actually do the trick. Just when you thought that the recruitment process wasn't stupid enough, artificial intelligence is now being adopted to make it a hell of a lot dumber. Large companies are using it during recruitment processes. The idea is that the applicant answers a few standard questions whilst filming themselves and then AI technology will analyse the language, tone and facial expressions of the candidate. The AI is trained to compare traits against those of prior interviewees who have shown to be good at their jobs. It does have some advantages as it is not subject to the recruiter's interviewing skills or their mood. Uh, however, there are some legitimate concerns about the technology. Unless the AI is trained on a large representative sample, the AI will likely be biased and discriminate against people of different backgrounds. In addition, the AI judges an individual on a short clip which shows a person responding in an interview situation and it is not a work setting involving teamwork although most bad interviews already do that anyway in other news, uh, in September, the Amory Ice Shelf has produced a very large 1,636 square kilometer iceberg, which is known as a carving event. And this is where a large chunk of ice breaks off the main shelf in Antarctica. And this thing is going to be a pain in the ass for shipping, but it is not associated with climate change. However, if you are a flat earther, you should be concerned, as a piece of the ice wall has now broken off and the ocean is being drained away. So, it is the time of year when the science community is anticipating the announcement of the Nobel Prizes. In this month's Physics World, Hamish Johnston explores the process of selecting who the winner of the Nobel Prize for Physics is. Each year the Nobel Prize winners are announced in October, but the selection process begins in September of the previous year. Nominations are submitted by 3,000 physicists, which include all the members of the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences and all previous laureates. Then all tenured professors in the Scandinavian countries and selected senior physicists around the world also get a say. Roughly 400 nominations get returned and the committee comprising eight scientists sift through the stack of nominations and select roughly 20 of the nominations. The committee then approaches specialists in the field of each of these 20 nominees and they get reports on their work. The committee then makes a recommendation based on these reports and proposes that to the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences. Once this recommendation is approved, a report is written about the winners and it will be made public once the prize is announced. The only question then remains is who will win it this month. So that was it for my first uh, quite editorialized news edition. Uh, let me know what you think in the comments section. Is this something that tickles you or is it a load of horseshit that should just be killed with fire? Let me know.